This is the first in a series of videos about Chapter 5, which is entitled Reactions and Aqueous Solutions. So if we're looking at reactions and aqueous solutions, we want to make sure that we remember some vocabulary that goes along with solutions. So of course the word solution, the term solution, refers to, as you can see on the slide, a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. Some examples of solutions would be sodium chloride dissolved in water, sugar dissolved in water, or any, any solid that is soluble in water that, is, that when it dissolves produces a clear solution that is homogeneous throughout. So it looks the same throughout the solution. The term solvent is used to describe the substance that does the dissolving. So if you're looking at an aqueous solution, the solvent would of course be water. The solute is the substance that gets dissolved in the solvent. So if you're looking at a solution of sodium chloride, then the sodium chloride would be the solvent in a solution. If you dissolve ions in aqueous solution, we call them electrolytes. So these, this slide is designed to show you why we can call those electrolytes. So if you look at the picture on the left, it's showing a crystal of sodium chloride in the red and green, and then it's showing you some water molecules that are smaller. And then on the right-hand side of the picture, it is showing you a chloride ion and a sodium ion that are surrounded by water molecules. So basically what happens is when an ion, ionic substance dissolves in water, the ions, the positive and negative ions, or the cations and anions, separate from each other and get surrounded by water molecules. Now think of water molecules. What do they do when, they, when it's just, a, when it's just a, like a glass of water? Those molecules flow past each other. So if you take the ions and surround them with water molecules, then the ions can also flow past each other. And so the ions are now free to move through the water. And if you look at this, the picture on the right, this shows what happens when you take a solution that has a salt dissolved in it, like sodium chloride, and apply a circuit to it. Notice that the negative ions that are in green are migrating towards the positive end of the electrical circuit, and the positive ions that are depicted in orange are migrating towards the negative side of the circuit. So in other words, when you dissolve ions in solution, they migrate based on charge and they carry that charge with them, which actually can produ produce the flow of electricity. So electricity, the flow of electricity, these substances are called electrolytes. So in order to be an electrolyte, an, uh, the uh, substance that dissolves in solution has to produce a charged particle. In other words, an ion, whether a positive ion or a negative ion. Okay, so not all solutions not all substances, rather, that dissolve in water produce ions. So some substances are electrolytes and some are not. So let's take a look at which ones are and which ones are not. Electrolytes can be strong or weak. Strong electrolytes are those types of substances, for example, like sodium chloride, that when they dissolve in water are highly soluble. So they dissociate 100%. So when you think about sodium chloride or table salt dissolving in water, it absolutely all dissolves. So if it all dissolves, then you end up with a high concentration of ions in solution. And because the ability of a substance to conduct electricity is dependent on the number of ions that are actually floating around in solution, the more ions you have, the stronger the electrolyte. Conversely, with weak electrolytes, uh, these are substances that only partially dissociate. So the example I have here is actually acetic acid, which is a weak acid. And so what that means is that only some of the acetic acid molecules give up their hydrogens. So what you end up with is a solution that has a very small concentration of ions in solution. So the lower the concentration, the 
the harder it is for that solution to conduct electricity, and that would be considered a weak electrolyte. So to kind of summarize, strong electrolytes would be composed of substances that are highly soluble in water, such as ionic compounds that have a high solubility. Whereas weak electrolytes might be substances like weak acids or bases, or ionic substances that are only slightly soluble in water, and so they only produce a small amount of ions in solution. We also have a class of substance that are considered non-electrolytes. These substances are solids that will dissolve in water, but when they dissolve in water, they don't produce ions. So think of sucrose. Sucrose is table sugar. Its formula is C12H22O11. And if we draw the structure of it, or part of the structure of it, you can see, and I'm just going to draw a stick structure here, that there's a six-membered ring. And what am I doing here? Okay, one, one, two. And a five-membered ring. This is kind of a poor drawing, but I think you'll be able to get the idea. So every time when you look at these stick figures, every bend in the figure represents a carbon. So there would be a carbon here, there would be a carbon here, 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 and here. Those are all carbons. Now, where do the hydrogen and oxygens come in? Well, this is the interesting part because almost every carbon has what we call a hydroxyl group associated with it. So we have an OH on every carbon. So I'm just going to draw a couple of them so you can get the idea. Carbons with OHs on them. So if you look carefully at those OH groups, don't they kind of resemble water? Where you have, instead of having an H on the other end of the oxygen, you have a carbon, and then you have an oxygen and a hydrogen attached to it. So think about this. If you have a water molecule, and remember that those water molecules, those oxygens, have those unbonded pairs of electrons on them, can you imagine that the oxygen, this oxygen here of the OH group, might interact with the hydrogen of a water molecule? And in fact, that's exactly what they do. They're really good at interacting with each other. So sucrose has all these OH groups around the outside of it. You know, think of this, they're all OH groups around the outside. That's how we get the structure of it, okay? So there's all these possibilities of OH groups or hydroxyl groups interacting with water molecules. And this is exactly how sucrose dissolves in water. If you've ever tried to dissolve sugar in water, you know that it dissolves pretty easily in water. And that is exactly because the OH groups on the sucrose interact with the OH groups within the water molecules. And so water molecules surround this entire molecule of sucrose. They surround the whole thing, but the point is that yes, the sucrose dissolves, one sucrose molecule separates from another, but the molecule itself does not break apart. It stays intact. And when it stays intact, that means that it does not produce ions in solution. And that's what makes sucrose a non-electrolyte. Now, if you look at ethanol, I'm going to draw ethanol down at the bottom. You have a CH3, you have a CH2, and then you have an OH. And there you have that nifty OH group again. We can assume that these are all hydrogens. You have that nifty OH group that is capable of interacting with a water molecule. So here you've got a water molecule. And the oxygen on the water molecule is going to interact with the hydrogen in the ethanol. And so ethanol can easily dissolve, but again, it does not break apart. The separate molecules separate from each other, but the molecule itself, this ethanol molecule that I'm going to circle right here, stays intact. It interacts with water and it dissolves that way, but it does not produce ions. Ethylene glycol is another interesting substance that has 
a C, two, it's double bonded carbons in the middle, H is on each of those, and then an OH on each end. This slide is getting kind of messy, but bear with me, an OH on each end. So you can see again that these OH groups interact with water molecules, and that's how ethylene glycol dissolves. But again, just like the sucrose and the ethanol, that molecule does not come apart. So this last slide is just a summary of, of kind of the characteristics of strong and weak electrolytes to help you identify what they are. So most salts, especially those that are highly soluble, are going to be strong electrolytes. Most acids are weak electrolytes because most acids are weak acids. The exceptions are the strong acids, which are listed here, hydrochloric, nitric, sulfuric, perchloric, hydrobromic, and hydroiodic. Those are the six strong acids, and everything else can be considered a weak acid. Common strong bases, which are the soluble hydroxide compounds, are the strong electrolytes. Ammonia, NH3, is a weak electrolyte because it is a weak base, and so it only partially ionizes. And most other substances, besides the one that we've already listed, like the examples on the previous slide, are non-electrolytes because they might dissolve in water, but they do not produce ions in water. So there you have it. Electrolytes are compounds that, when they dissolve in water, produce ions, which allows the charge to flow through the solution.